am so excited to be with you all. My name is Hosanna. If I haven't got to meet you yet, I'm one of the pastors in our church network, as well as the wife to the great bearded man with the guitar here. That one's mine. So we've been here at this church for a few months now. We love being a part of this church family, and I love getting to teach in our network, but there's something really special about getting to speak where you go to church on Sundays. So thank you for giving me this honor. We so love being a part of this church in this season right now with Mingo and Fallon leading the charge. We've been friends with Dr. Tim Scott and Kimberly Scott for years. And just being part of this cross-generational leadership team is one of the greatest honors of our lives. So I'm so excited to get to speak to you today as we are in a series called 40 Days of Wisdom. And in this series, we as a church have been going through the book of Proverbs and unpacking and unveiling some wisdom nuggets that we find in this book. And we all get wisdom from different places. We get it from inspirational quotes on Instagram. We get it from TED Talks. We get it from cool how-to books, you know. And one of my favorite places to get wisdom from is life hacks on the internet. There are these super cool ways where people have found, sometimes some crazy ways, but usually practical ways where people have taken everyday items maximize them to their full potential, learned how to bring them out to their full purpose to help us solve some everyday problems. So I'm going to show you a few that me and my husband Guy found this week, kind of thinking of, man, what are some of the best life hacks we've ever found on the internet? Here's a few of them. Here's one right here on the screen. Here's how to amplify your phone speakers. You don't have to buy a bougie speaker. You don't have to buy a $200 amplifier. You can just put your phone in a glass cup. Boom. Amazing volume. I'm guessing that many of us do this, seeing as how old that phone is. I'm sure this secret has been here for a while. Here's another one right here. Here's one of our favorites. If you're anything like me and my husband, we go to Trader Joe's, we get a bunch of bananas, and the next day, it's like they're all bad overnight. Here's a life hack. You put saran wrap on the very top of your bananas, and they'll stay good for three to four days longer. Right? Isn't that, aren't you glad you came to church today? That's right. Don't miss next week. This stuff is good. Here's another one right here. You having problems dipping your Oreos in milk? There's a life hack for that. You get some chopsticks, just dip it right into that milk. This is very relevant to me. I'm Chinese. I don't know if my ancestors would approve of this exactly. But, hey, here's another way to use chopsticks. Life hack. Here's a final one. You don't like cold pizza? You don't have a microwave? No problem. There's a life hack. You just get a dryer. I, don't, I can't really fend for that one. But anyways, there's lots of different life hacks on the internet. Ways to take everyday items to solve everyday problems. I love life hacks. And I actually kind of think of the book of Proverbs as a book of life hacks. Here's a bunch of wisdom nuggets. Here's a bunch of secret life keys that help us figure out how to life hack some of the situations our lives are in. How do we use our lives to their full potential? How do we live up to our full purpose? Because none of us want to get to the end of our lives and realize that we didn't live our full purpose and potential out. And the book of Proverbs talks a lot about having wisdom specifically in the workplace which is what we're going to talk about today, who we are and how we are when it comes to work. And it makes sense that Proverbs talks a lot about it because research has shown us that one third of our lives is spent working. I know, I didn't want to bum you out on a Sunday. You're like, bring up the Oreo pictures some more. It's true. One third of our lives are spent working, so it must be important what our attitudes are like, what we are like when it comes to the workplace, and how we have wisdom in this one precious one-third of our one precious life. So we're going to get into the book of Proverbs and figure out some life hacks when it comes to the workplace. We find our first life hack in Proverbs 24, 30, and 32. One day I passed by the field of a lazy man, and I noticed the vineyards of a slacker. I observed nothing but thorns, weeds, and broken down walls, so I considered their lack of wisdom, and I pondered the lessons I could learn from this. Now, this field in Proverbs directly relates to our lives. First, the writer is saying, you know, the first thing I did was look at somebody else's body of work. The first thing I did is see what did somebody else do. For many of us, that's the life hack that we need to look at what other people have done before us, who has gone before us, and have the humility to learn from those who may be wiser than us. We can learn a lot about what to do and what not to do by simply looking at people who have gone before us. But then the writer continues to say, man, this 
This field was torn to shreds. No one was taking care of it. No one was intentional with it. There's just thorns and weeds and broken down walls because it turns out that a beautiful garden is not built on autopilot. This does just not come out of nowhere with no intentionality. And the exact same thing goes for our lives. Many of us, we want the beautiful garden. We want the impressive resume. We would love that beautiful body of work, but many of us are less interested in the work it would take to get there. The very first life hack we learn from the book of Proverbs when it comes to work is don't be entitled, be invested. Don't be entitled. Don't assume that you have the right to a position that you did not work for. Instead, be invested and be consistently investing. Many of us, we want trees and God gives us seeds. He says, I've given you something small. What are you gonna do with it? How are you gonna plant it? How are you gonna water it? You want trees, here's a seed. Many of us, we want success and God wants that for us. That is a good thing. And God has given us the opportunity to be faithful with what we already have. And if you're new to this church thing, I want you to know with all our hearts, we believe that God can do anything but God will not force us to take care of our lives. Many of us, we just want God to give it and God is saying, grow it. I've given you opportunities and the mental capacity to do many things. I'm not gonna just give it, I want you to grow it. I remember when I was growing up, one of my very first jobs-ish was when I was in junior high and I grew up playing basketball. I grew up in a basketball family. I am from San Francisco and a Golden State Warriors fan, so I'm going through a lot this year. You can pray for me. But I grew up in a basketball family and when I was in junior high, there was a program where the students could learn how to be referees and they could ref games, even the high schoolers games. And I wanted to be a referee, first of all, for the outfit. I wanted that new outfit. I thought it was so cool with the white and black stripes. Then there was whistles. I wanted a dope whistle. I wanted, to be, I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to have authority. And I had some questions about how the other referees were calling the games. And I thought I could do a little bit better than some of them. And that character trait has not changed in me. I do still have some questions about the NBA finals, but that's okay. That's for another sermon. And I thought I could do better. And I was kind of bummed out that they weren't calling me up. How come they weren't inviting me to this program? Finally, they did. I got the cool shirt, I got the cool whistle, I went to the gym, the lights came on, the game started and I realized, oh shoot, I did not know how to call any of these fouls. I actually did not know how to be a referee at this level of a game. What was revealed in public was proof of everything I had done to study in private, which was nothing. I did not spend my time when no one was looking at my house looking at plays or trying to research fouls or asking other referees how I should ref this game. I assumed that since I knew how to play the game, I would know how to lead the game. And in this verse we're learning, don't be entitled to a position you didn't work for. You gotta be invested. So when it comes to the workplace, I think a lot about this. If any of us are in a position where we feel like we're not getting everything we can out of this job, we're not too happy with what we're getting back from this position, my first question would be, are we fully investing in the season that we're in? Or do we feel entitled to a position we did not earn? And if we got the job or the task or the position that we are praying for, do we have the work ethic to match it? Now there's a man in the Bible who is a great example of this. His name is Joseph. We find Joseph in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. And we learn a lot from his life, how we can have wisdom in the workplace. And his life is gonna show us some life hacks. Joseph was a shepherd. His dad and his brothers were shepherds before him, so they taught him how to do it. And from his dad, he learned how to be a man of character, how to be a man with integrity, how to lead and how to worship God through everything he did. But Joseph had a bit of a pride problem. And so his brothers sold him, you know, as brothers and sisters do. And they sold him to the slave marketers. And the person that bought Joseph was a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar was the head of the kitchen of Pharaoh, who was the king over all of Egypt. So here we have Pharaoh, the king over all of Egypt. We have Pharaoh, the head of his kitchen. And down here we have Joseph, who's a slave. And Joseph from the bottom was excellent. Joseph was excellent. He likely applied many of the leadership skills he learned as a shepherd 
but he also had to learn a lot of new things in this new role, in this new location, and even in a job role that he would not have been proud to have, he still invested in where he was. In fact, Pharaoh and Potiphar had something in common that we'll learn in this story. Potiphar ends up promoting Joseph to be head of all of his household. Here we see an example that even in unideal situations, we can be standouts in our field. And I believe in that for the church. I believe in us. I believe that God wants all of us to be standouts in our field. I believe that God wants us to be people of influence in our industries, to be people of uncommon character in common workplaces. And here Joseph is an example of that. What would it look like if all of us were invested in places we feel we are above? So Joseph gets promoted to be the head of Potiphar's household. And then Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. It was a whole thing. And then Joseph straight up runs. He gets out of that situation. Even though he was a slave, he respected the authority over him too much. He respected Potiphar too much. He respected God too much. That even though he probably could have gotten away with some things in that situation, he ran away from any temptation that would dishonor his boss. Now, maybe we don't have the same kind of temptations like that in our workplaces, but many of us have had the chance to cheat on our taxes. Many of us have had the chance to tell our boss that we worked hours that we did not. Many of us, we have had the opportunity to dishonor God in ways we think we can get away with. And here in this story, we see an example of a man who shows us that we can have unprecedented integrity, that we could be above and beyond reproach even when nobody is looking. Now Potiphar's wife, she had some issues and so she ends up telling her husband that Joseph tried to seduce her. So Joseph ends up in prison. And even in prison, he was excellent. He cared for the prisoners, he worked hard, and the jailer ends up making Joseph in charge of all of the prisoners. Here he is, doing something totally different, in a totally different work environment, and he still is just being excellent. Over time, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, his cupbearer and his baker offend him, and they end up in prison right where Joseph is. Joseph is intentional with them. He cares for them. They both have terrible, tormenting dreams, and he seeks God on their behalf to interpret their dreams for them. What would our world look like if we went above and beyond for people in our workplace? Above the call of duty, even when we've clocked out, what kind of doors would that open? What kind of character would that build in us? What would that say about you? Over time, the cupbearer gets brought back into the palace. He goes back to work for Pharaoh. And two years pass, two years pass where Joseph is still investing here in this jail. And Pharaoh also has a dream that torments him terribly. And the cupbearer remembers someone that he knew in jail named Joseph. Someone who was wise and kind that went above and beyond. And Joseph ends up going in front of the king, seeking God to interpret Pharaoh's dream for him. And then Pharaoh ends up promoting Joseph to be the second in command of all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. So here we are seeing a biblical example of what the great poet Drake once said, which he started from the bottom, now he is here. But how did he get here? How did he get to this place of authority? Why was he given this opportunity? We learn our second life hack for wisdom in work, make excellence your brand. We learn it from the life of Joseph. What are you known for at work? What do people say about you? What do they think you're gonna do if they give you a project? How do they think you're going to lead? Make excellence your trademark. Make going above and beyond what people expect is your stamp on every project that you ever have your hands on. Refuse to reach for the status quo. Instead, raise the standard. Don't just settle for what your friends are doing. Don't just settle for what your coworkers are doing. Don't just settle for what you hear other people in the industry are doing. I believe that we have the power, if we chose to, to set the bar, to raise the standard, not just for ourselves, but for our coworkers, our industries, and our world. In fact, I believe that applies no matter how old you are. Even before you have the degree, even before you're married, no matter what age you're in or what grade you're in, that you have the potential to raise the bar in your class, in your school, and for the industry you want to be in. I believe in millennials, I believe in Gen Z, and I believe that we don't have to be entitled, we can be invested. And even where we are, we can make excellence our brand. 
So we see that Joseph was an example of this. We see that he lived this. He was not entitled, he was invested. He made excellence his brand. And here in Proverbs 22, 29, we read this. As for those who are skilled in their work, they will be recognized and invited to serve kings. Now that's exactly what happened with Joseph. And that directly applies to our lives. God cares that we're skilled. God cares that we're investing in new skills. And when you are faithful with what you already have, and you care about the skills that you, know, you already have, and you keep honing into those, I think that's when you begin to attract kings. See, many of us, we spend less time honing in on our skills, and we spend more time chasing kings. We spend more time saying, man, when I work for that king, then I'm going to be a good worker. Man, when I work for that person of influence and I'm going to care about my job, I'm going to form some good habits. Man, when my boss pays more attention to me, when my boss cares more about my personal life, then I'm going to go above and beyond and show everybody how good of a leader I am. And this verse is saying that's not how it works. You're skilled at what you already do and you will attract kings because people with good work ethic want to work with people with good work ethic. It attracts your boss, your boss's boss, CEOs of companies, titans of industry, those who know God and those who do not. You know who they want at their table? People that care about what they already do. In fact, in Luke, we read this, Luke 16, 10, if you're faithful in small scale matters, you'll be faithful with far bigger responsibilities. If you are crooked in small responsibilities, you'll be no different in bigger things. Why do we think we're gonna be a different worker if we have a different boss? Our boss and our title does not dictate our work ethic. We dictate our work ethic. And in this verse, we hear that God cares about faithfulness. Faithfulness when no one is looking. Faithfulness, the kind that's not cute. Faithfulness, the stuff that happens in secret. Faithfulness, the stuff that people don't post on Facebook. Faithfulness in the small things. Faithfulness in the hard things. Favor is up to God, but faithfulness is up to us. We learn a third life hack right here from the life of Joseph. Lead before you're a leader. Lead before you're a leader. Clay Scroggins wrote an awesome book called How to Lead When You're Not in Charge. And in it, he says this, God doesn't want us to sit back he wants us to responsibly engage, doing the work he has given us wherever we are, with whatever title or role he has currently assigned to us. Clay Scroggins is writing a book to people that want to be leaders but are not yet leaders, and he is saying that your title and your position is not an excuse to just sit back and squander the opportunity God has already put in front of you. Don't make an excuse. Don't squander this. Many of us, we want the promotion, but we want to skip the process. Many of us, we want the respect. We want the recognition, but we want to skip the responsibility. Many of us, we want the title. We see people who have the title. We think we'd be better if we had the title. And God is saying, you want the title? What is your trail? What have you already done? What does your body of work already show about you? And if I opened all the doors and gave you the job you were praying for, do you have the honor, the integrity, the character, the attitude, the work ethic to match it? What if you got the job you were praying for? Who are you when then you get that job? We would not have to campaign for something that our life was already proof of. It kind of makes me think of um, dating shows on television. Sometimes there's these dating shows where there's all these guys trying to date the same girl, so they're all trying to campaign for why she should pick them. They'll say some crazy things. One of my favorite things that a lot of them will say is, you know, everyone else thinks I'm the best looking guy they've ever met. You know, every other girl I've ever dated says I'm the hottest. And they're trying to campaign for something that you're kind of like, if you were good looking, wouldn't I know? That's typically something you don't have to convince somebody you're dating. That is something I am able to see and be an eyewitness of. And now that's too real for some of us, but that's exactly what some of our workplaces are like. Man, if you gave me that budget, I would be killing it at this job. Man, if you gave me that resource, I'd be a great leader. You know what, if they gave me this title, I would for sure show up. But if you were a great leader, wouldn't we know? Wouldn't you already have a trail that proved it? 
wouldn't you already have a body of work that showed it? You wouldn't have to campaign for something that your life was already proof of. Joseph lived the title before he had the title. And by the time he was second in charge of all of Egypt, he already had a lot of leadership practice, intense integrity practice. He had a reputation based on his repetition of what he was doing over and over again in every workplace. Joseph did not go to school to be second in charge of all of Egypt. No, he took every opportunity he had throughout his life, no matter how small, to constantly be developing character, to be the man that could lead Egypt, to be the man that could live up to the role when the door finally opened. Now, another thing I love about this verse in Proverbs 22, 29, I love that it says, for those who are skilled in their work, they will be recognized and invited to serve kings because I believe that God is calling us to be skilled in our workplaces and to look different than other people in our workplaces. But something I noticed in this verse while I was studying for this talk stood out to me in a way I've never seen it before. The verse does not say work hard and you'll become a king. It says work hard and you'll be recognized and invited to serve kings. It says you don't work hard and then graduate to a place where you don't have to serve anybody. Instead, we see that service is still the goal. You work hard and then you get to serve. Now, if you're new to this church thing or new to this God thing, we welcome you. I'm so excited you're here. I want you to know that we believe when it comes to kings, and the world has a lot, we just believe with all our hearts that Jesus is the king over all the kings. And we just believe that Jesus is the Lord over all the lords. And when we, as Christ followers, as Jesus people, when we're at our best, which isn't all the time, but when we're at our best, we see everything we do as an opportunity to serve him. And hopefully we get really skilled at all the things we do and all the things we care about, and then we get to better serve him. And hopefully we get all the job opportunities and all the open doors and all the promotions, and then we get to better serve him. Service is not the means to the end. Service is the whole goal. Now there is a reason why Joseph was not entitled, but he was invested. There's a reason why Joseph made excellence his brand. There was a reason why Joseph led way before he was a leader. And we find here in his reason, perhaps the greatest life hack when it comes to work of them all. We find it in Colossians 3. Put your heart and soul into every activity you do as though you are doing it for the Lord himself and not merely for others. Another translation says it like this. I love it. It's so good. So no matter what your task is, work hard. Always do your best as the Lord's servant, not as man's. Joseph did not see everything he was doing as an opportunity to serve the jailer or an opportunity to serve Potiphar or Pharaoh. He saw everything he did as an opportunity to serve God. A king he saw was beyond all the other kings. In fact, when Joseph was in front of Pharaoh about to interpret his dream, on the cusp of his greatest promotion, he says this, we find it in Genesis 41, 16, it is beyond my power to do this. But God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. Joseph gave God all the glory when he was a slave. And he gave God all the glory when he was in front of the king. We learn our final life hack from Joseph right here. It's not just work. It's worship. It's not just work. One third of your life is not just one third of your life. It's not just work. It's worship. And if this is your first time in church, I want you to know what we believe about worship. Worship is not just us singing songs to God with music, though that's a big part of it and we love doing that. Worship is not just when we volunteer at church on Sundays, though that's a big part of that and we love that. Worship is actually not a church thing. We all do it. We all just worship different things. Worship is whatever you bow down to whatever you make all your decisions based on, whatever you glorify, which means makes bigger in your life, whatever you magnify, which means making greater in your life. We all worship something. It might be Instagram, it might be sports, it might be success, it might be money, it might be relationships. We all worship something. But when we come to a place with Jesus, 
When we choose that he's our number one, now we're worshiping him. We're bowing down to him. We're making him higher, making him greater. And this verse is saying, in everything we do, we have an opportunity to worship him. We don't work hard because we love our bosses. We work hard because we love God and we see our work as an opportunity to worship him. We don't work hard because we think this job is the end all be all, but because we see service as the end all be all. And we see our work as an opportunity to worship. And at the end of the day, worship is our response to who God is. At the end of the day, worship is whatever you do in response to what he's done for you. So how are we responding? And how are we responding at work, through our art, through our volunteers, through our service projects, through our homework? How are we responding to God? Like this verse says, everything you do, all to God. I'll never forget a few years ago, I was at an event, uh, we had tickets for months, the artists had months to prepare, and it was an artist showcase, like an open mic, but you had like audition to do it, so it was a showcase. I've gone to many in my life, I'm a huge fan of the arts. I love seeing people tell their stories through poetry, dancing, singer-songwriters, I just think it's the coolest. And this event happened to be a Christian event, which I hadn't been to a ton of Christian events like that, and I just knew it was gonna be awesome because it was gonna be about Jesus, so it was gonna be the best. And I remember sitting there, and it was one of the most bizarre experiences I've had at one of these showcases. Every single artist before they performed grabbed the microphone and made an excuse for why this wasn't gonna be very good. They would say things like, sorry, I didn't really prepare that much this morning or these past few months. I've been really busy, but you know, all glory to God, it's just worship. And then the next performer would come up and say something very similar. These words aren't gonna be good. I'm not gonna know the chords really well. I haven't had time these past couple of weeks, but you know what, it's just worship. All glory to God, he knows our hearts. And I was bummed out because that was not the best showcase I had ever seen. But it also broke my heart a little bit. It was almost like someone had given them all a script because their excuses were so similar about how to use God as an excuse for why something wasn't very good. It was like someone had convinced them that worship didn't have to be very good. It's like someone convinced them that God is okay with your second, third, fourth, or fifth best, that worship doesn't have to be very good. Just worship, just worship. It's like someone convinced them that grace, which is something we all live under and we all need, and it's a good thing. It's like someone convinced them that grace was an excuse to do less as opposed to a reason to give more. And for the record, I believe that Christian art should be better than the world's art. I believe that we should be better at worshiping God than the world is at worshiping itself. And I think that applies to all of our workplaces. Our standard for work ethic should be better than our coworkers. We should be out honoring all of our coworkers when it comes to how much can we honor our boss. Our standard should be higher because we serve a greater king. When we worship God with work, it should be better. This should be our best. A life hack that I have found in my life when it comes to work is to change my question. Change my question from, am I being wise at work? Because I don't always know what's wise. Am I being wise at work? To am I worshiping God with my work? Is this my best? Does this worship God? Because that I know. That I know where my heart is. That I know if I'm actually worshiping God or who am I worshiping in this. As I send this email to this client, does this honor God? As I have this conversation on the phone with my boss, does this honor God? As I put this level of effort into this project that was entrusted to me, does this honor God? Is this my best? Is this how I wanna to respond to what God has done for me? Now we have to be careful though. We have to be careful, because I believe we gotta give God our best but as a recovering workaholic, I can tell you, we have to make sure that we are worshiping God with our work and not making work our worship. We can't be worshiping work. It's important and it is good. But we cannot be ignoring our families, avoiding our spouses, being so consumed and obsessed with our career ambitions that we don't have friendships like we used to. We're not going to church like we used to. We don't care about Sabbath or rest or any other spiritual practice. We have a bad attitude. We've broken a lot of ties. 
because we're so consumed with producing well at work. That's not worshiping God. That's worshiping work. And we can't find our identity in what we do. We have to find our identity in what Jesus did. We cannot find who we are in what we do. We have to find our identity in who Jesus is. When we find ourselves in Jesus, when we find ourselves in a place where we have chosen Jesus, when we find ourselves in a place where we have chosen to live in his freedom, it changes everything. We no longer work to be loved, we're already really loved. We no longer have to hustle to achieve value, we're already more valuable than we've ever imagined. We no longer have to work to attain a status of salvation or right standing with God. In fact, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. This is bad news for all the workaholics in the room. We cannot get an A plus on this. Bad news for all the overachievers in the room. We can't, we can't achieve this. We receive grace plain and simple when we believe. And when we find ourselves in Jesus, when we believe in Jesus and we find the freedom that's only in him, we think differently and we work differently because now we work from a place of freedom, not for freedom. We work from a place of value, not for value. We work from a place of salvation, not for salvation. We work from a place of knowing who we are, not working to know who we are. A few years ago, I found myself in a place where I was completely consumed by my job, obsessed with my work, obsessed with my projects. I didn't even recognize the woman in the mirror. It was destroying relationships around me. And I came to a place where I was surrendering to God, my attitude, my dreams, asking him, how do I do this well? How do I work hard and worship well? And what's the answer? And I'll do anything. And I was reminded of something, something I've remembered ever since, something that's changed how I see work forever. I was reminded that the most important work has already been finished. And the most urgent task has already been accomplished. Jesus already came and solved our biggest problem, that our sins have separated us from God. But because Jesus came and he died for all of our brokenness and then he rose again, he made it possible for us to instantly come to God as we are, be forgiven and live a brand new life. I am a broken person that doesn't have to pay the penalty for my brokenness. Why was I working so hard? As if my life depended on it. It turns out it doesn't. We cannot be defined by what we do. We have to be defined by what Jesus did for us and he already did it. There is no point in us working like our lives depended on it. We're working like Jesus is still dead. Jesus accomplished the biggest problem. And my hope for all of us is that we come to a place where we can wake up in the morning and instead of dealing with stress and anxiety, we think it is finished. And now from here, I work. Instead of waking up consumed with, with stress about our work projects, we wake up thinking the most important work's been accomplished and now from here, I work. Our worship, everything that we do in work, in our lives, is our opportunity to respond to God because of what he did. Not because of what we did, but because of what he already did. Hey, if you came in today and got a program, there is a connection card in it, if you would pull that out really quick. And on the connection card is a, a spot that says, this week I will. This week I will, what will we do? Because we don't believe in teaching anything on Sundays that you can't use during the week. And one third of this week you're gonna be working, so this is gonna be good. On your connection card, what life hack do you wanna use? Maybe you're thinking, I wanna be a little bit less entitled in some areas, I wanna be invested. You know, I don't know what my brand is at work, I think I wanna to try to make it excellence. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm gonna start leading even though I'm not a leader. 
Or maybe you've only seen work as a drag and you want to start changing your perspective as an opportunity to worship God. Or maybe you too have been so defined by what you do and what you produce and how you achieve and what you get an A on. And you want to surrender to God this week and say, man, I want to live from a place where the most important work has already been finished. I want to live and worship like that. I hope that for all of us here, that we change our question to how can we be wise at work to how can we worship God with this work? I'm going to pray for each and every one of us before we head into our work week. Would you stand with me? I love to pray over you. After we pray, we're going to sing this song, What a Beautiful Name. And it is a simple, sweet song to Jesus, worshiping him for who he is and what he did, not what we've done. So we're going to kick off this week worshiping God through music and then hopefully continuing to worship him during this week through our lives and our decisions. I'm going to pray for each and every one of us. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would remind us every day this week how we can be wise in the workplace how we can have integrity in the workplace, how we can out honor people in the workplace, how we can live for a higher standard and a greater purpose in the workplace. Remind us of how we can best worship you. And God, I pray specifically for people in this room, those of us who lead teams, those of us who are bosses, I pray that you would give us strategies, that you would give us grace, that you would help us lead well in the opportunity we've been given. And I pray specifically for every person in here who's between jobs, that you would give them open doors, that you would give them favor, that you would give them peace and help them develop the character they need in this season before all those doors open. We pray for favor on their lives, Lord. Would you open the doors? We love you more than anything. You're the best thing in our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs>